1 Peter chapter 3. We'll be in verses 1 through 7 this morning. I will admit that after being away for a few weeks, when, uh, when I opened this up, I was like, really? This is the text I get to preach when I come back? All I'm doing is confessing to you my own human weakness and limitation. I would have preferred a different text. Um, but the Lord in his grace, even as I studied through this, um, really showed me ways in which I needed to hear this passage this week. So if you would follow along with me in your Bibles or on the screen in front of you. First Peter chapter 3, verses 1-7. through seven. Peter says, Likewise, wives... Be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. This is the word of the Lord to the people of God this morning. Amen? Amen. Let me pray. Join me. Father, Lord, we, we thank you for your word. We trust and believe that you know exactly what we need to hear from you this morning. We trust and believe that you know exactly what is going on in each of our hearts as we walk in this place. Father, we recognize as we read this text that this text is about wives and husbands, and yet we recognize that there are going to be those of us in this room that are one end of the pendulum swaying from single to single for a long time to married to divorced to somewhere in between. And, uh, and yet uh, we trust that this word is what you had in mind for us to hear this morning. And I pray, Father, that you would come and and speak, that you would help me to proclaim you and your goodness to this group of your sheep, not mine, your church, not mine. I pray, Father, that you would give a life-giving, encouraging, strengthening, or maybe even rebuking word and a healing word um, at the same time. Father, help us. Most of all, to listen to you, to hear you, to trust you, and to believe in you. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. So again, I admit, if I I was able to choose a text to jump into this morning after being away for a bit, this would not be the one. Um, And that's, like I said, just kind of my own, probably my own uh, sinful uh, weakness, right? Um passage today uh, is addressed to wives and husbands. And uh, a caveat on the front edge, if you're here with us and you're you're single, or maybe you're divorced, or maybe you've lived in the pain of loneliness of not being in a marriage or relationship for years, uh, whatever that place may be for you, what I would trust is the Lord would use us to speak to you as as a woman or as a man, period, right? Um, but it's not like the things that are taught in this text are just applied to those who have a marriage certificate somewhere. Um, there are things in this text that should be applied to our lives as men and women, period, who are trying to follow God. Um, and if you're here and you're not following God, and you're here kind of checking that out, then, then this might be a bit of an invitation to you as you see what God calls his people to and what God does when his people fail those expectations. Okay. So that bit of an introduction aside, as I sat and looked at this text this week, I was trying to figure out like what would be the best way to start this sermon off. Um, preachers always like to use catchy little stories, stupid little jokes, so on and so forth. And, uh, and I tried to come up with some that just didn't work. 
And I kept feeling, feeling the Lord just kind of impress on me, like, you need, to, you need to preach out of your own story in some regard. And some of you know uh, some of my story, some of Christy and I's story. Seems like it would be appropriate to maybe uh, start there, share a little bit of Christy and I's journey, um, hoping that it will help kind of set the stage uh, for what I think the Lord wants to say uh, through this text. Um, Christy and I have been married for roughly almost 19 years. Almost 19 years. That's a long time, right? Two decades. Almost two decades. Um, two decades we've been journeying uh, kind of through some of the highways and the byways, the high times and the low times of life together. We've given a significant portion of our lives and that time of our lives to raising seven children. Um, given a significant portion of those 19 years to serving the Lord together. But here's the reality. Christy and I did not meet each other 19 years ago. Uh, we met each other actually roughly 27 years ago. I was trying to do the, the math on it the other day, and Christy's probably going to correct me afterwards because she's better with numbers than I am, but because but she's, she's a numbers geek and I'm not. And so <laughs> she's, I can tell she's already computing in her head. Did he get this right? And it's okay. I need to be correct. Keeps me humble and uh, humiliates me because I suck at numbers and she's good. Anyways, roughly 27 years ago, okay, it was the summer of 1994, I think, uh, Playmore Ballroom in Lincoln, Nebraska. If you, raise your hand if you've ever been there, ever heard of it, ever drove by it, okay. Uh, it was Country Western Dance Hall in Lincoln, Nebraska. And I'm going to be honest with you, the first time that I laid eyes on Christy, honestly, she took my breath away, right, because she's absolutely beautiful. She's like, stop it. It's absolutely beautiful in my mind. I mean, in my mind, hottest thing that ever jumped on the dance floor for sure. Sure, pastors aren't supposed to say that, but I just did too bad, right? <laughs> I love, I love talking to my wife up in front of other people. Part of it's because it makes me feel good, and I don't talk her up enough when I'm at home with her. That's honesty. Uh, but part of her love language is, is uh, words of affirmation. And I confess that although I'm a guy that's full of words, my words do not often... Uh, build her up the way that I wish they would. When I saw her uh, roughly 27 years ago, though, um, man, I thought she was gorgeous. Just the, the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. In fact, I was so overcome with how hot she was that it took me like three or four weeks to actually ask this girl to dance with me, okay? <laughs> I, I mean, I, if you can pick, I was the nerd, okay? My, short, my, my jeans were too short. My boots were too big. My cowboy hat was a 10-gallon hat. My hair was long. I mean, I was a geek. I was homeschooled, so I didn't have good social skills to begin with. <laughs> okay. And I, 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 I don't care what that means for other homeschoolers, but for me, I'll just tell you, it meant that I had no good social skills. Okay. I grew up with horses and chickens and ducks as my best friends. I didn't grow up with other kids in a classroom on a daily basis. So no social skills. Still lack some today, as you can, you can tell. Long story short, though, I, I, was, I was head over heels in love. With her from the moment. In fact, in fact, Bunny Trail, real quick, like my pickup line when I first danced with her was, hey, yo, uh, my mom has horses. You want to come over and ride some of them someday with me? <laughs> <laughs> she gave me her number. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> but here's the reality, okay? Reality, as most of you know, is that the next eight years, anybody in here got an eight year old kid? Okay, or, or one that's even a little over eight, so you, like, you recognize what, you know, can. Picture eight years in your mind. Um, the next eight years for us were anything but glorious, okay? Uh, neither one of us knew the Lord. Both of us were trying to cope with, with many previous years of unchecked sin in our lives, of taking its toll on our hearts, taking its toll on our lives. Simply put, both of us, both of us um, had conducted our lives in ways that were so devastating to one another that if, if you actually knew the details, probably, probably blow your mind. You probably wonder what I'm doing up here on this stage preaching. Okay. Maybe, um, maybe it would actually help to share some of those details with you so that you might see how I might arrive at a text like this and see that God would speak something through it to broken people as he redeems them and transforms their lives. 
first eight years of uh, Chrissy and I's relationship was uh, honestly very full of the devastating effects of sin. Okay, despite being uh, madly in love with each other, um, neither one of us was actually ready to serve each other in marriage. Um, over the course of those first eight years of our relationship, we, we both engaged in uh, extramarital affairs. I say plural. Uh, I was hooked on pornography um, in a way that you, you wouldn't believe if I told you. I remember telling Christy one time, if there was a way that I could take all the images out of the filing cabinets that are in my mind and put them on a white sheet in front of you with a projector screen, you'd be horrified and I don't think you'd want to be married to me anymore. Now, thank God she loves Jesus. Um, so I was hooked on pornography. Uh, there was a strip club down the street from where we lived. I visited that place daily, multiple times. Top it all off, I, I was smoking as much weed, drinking as much alcohol as you possibly could. Now, the day that I began following Jesus, I'm pretty sure it was a sunny day. I'm almost certain of it. Not only was it a sunny day just by way of metaphor, but I'm pretty sure it was a sunny day. I was out on my motorcycle. It was June of 2000. Uh, I was on the corner of 6th and Cornusker Highway in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, I was just two blocks down from that strip club that I used to frequent on a daily basis. And on that street corner, the Lord, the Lord saw fit to uh, radically change my life when I pulled that motorcycle out in front of an SUV that was traveling 50 miles an hour. So the next thing that I know that happens is I wake up in the middle of the street, got a broken femur bone, got broken ribs, broken collarbone, left foot is backwards, that's horrendous. Um, long story short, what happened to me that day is the Lord spoke to me in the middle of the street, he, and, and I gave my life to him, I entrusted my life to Jesus, and honestly I never looked back, it's almost 21 years ago, right? The years following that day were absolutely nothing short of an absolute miracle. I mean, here's the reality. I woke up again that afternoon from that accident. I was in the intensive care unit with my wife and my girlfriend on either side of the bed from me. And I always say that I thought I, maybe I was in hell, right? Um, that day's got nothing on what hell will be like. I'm so sure of that now that I know more. Um, my four oldest daughters, Aubrey, Harley, Hope and faith were also there too. So you can kind of track that in our, in our seven kids' history and see the kind of life we lived uh, in those first, those first early years. Now over the next two years after that accident, I began to follow the Lord. Christy and I actually got divorced. Most of you probably don't even know that, I'm assuming. Uh, Christy moved on to um, a different guy, um, and, and I tried to make things work with the girlfriend uh, that was in the hospital room with me. And, and the girlfriend from the hospital room actually became my wife for about six months, um, at the end of which she actually flipped me the bird, ran off with a dude that was twice her age. Now, during that time, um, Christy tried several times um, to find her worth and her value in the arms of other men. Uh, she eventually had a, an emotional breakdown. I'd love for her to tell you this story someday because the way she tells it is much better than the way I tell it. But had an emotional breakdown uh, late one evening um, after another relationship fell apart. That opened the door for our oldest daughter at the age of five years old to share the gospel with my wife. She began following Jesus that day, I think it was the winter of 2001, and then on October 18th of 2002, roughly a year later, we were remarried. And we've been following the Lord together ever since. And one of the questions, so that's the power of what God can do in people's lives. It doesn't matter how far you fall off the radar <coughs> as an individual within your marriage or anywhere, God can do massive, powerful, transforming things in our lives. Why? Because he left the tomb empty. Okay? And any person who can leave a tomb empty and walk out of that alive, that's God. Right? Like you and I don't have that power without him. The question that has weighed on our minds over these years, right, as we've followed the Lord together, Christy and I, the question is simply this, like, how... 
How has God called us to live our lives in a way that actually honors him? How, what does God expect from us? How does he want us to conduct our lives as a husband and as a wife? Okay? If you're married, then you've asked that question in some way or another. How, what am I, how am I supposed to behave? What am I supposed to do? If you're single, you're asking, man, what, what kind of man am I looking for? What kind of a woman am I, am I looking for? What kind of a man am I supposed to be when it gets time for marriage? What kind of a woman am I supposed to be when it comes that time? You're asking questions like that, and I think God wants to answer that question today through what Peter says. Because he speaks to wives and husbands. He basically says, yo, this is the way that you're to conduct your life. So let's start, let's start with, the first, with the first part, wives. Because that's where Peter starts, right? How should a wife, a godly wife, conduct herself? What should the conduct of a godly wife look like? Those are ways you would ask the question. What does Peter say? How does he answer that question? There's a few things that he says. Um, but I think before jumping into those three things that he says, you're tracking with me. I'm sorry, Bryce. <laughs> Um, before we jump into those three things that he actually says to wives, I think it's really important, and you can leave that slide up, because we can all take notes for now, and then you'll know where I'm headed. Before we jump in there, I think it's really important to say, okay, what's the context of what Peter's about to say? Um, in the context of First Peter, if you take it like a book, right, and you go, okay, something is being said by the author inside of this letter, uh, you need to pay attention to the main themes in the letter. That's what you've got to do. So um, it appears to me, as you look at 1 Peter, that Peter is actually concerned with the conduct of his listeners, the lifestyle of his listeners as they live out their Christian faith in a world that is hostile to godly values. Does that sound familiar to you? <coughs> like, we're trying to live in a world that many times is very hostile to the way God calls us to live. And Peter is trying to answer that question, trying to give that kind of instruction um, in this letter. If you go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, you look at verse 1, you'll find that it is absolutely clear that Peter's listeners are living as, as outsiders in exile. They're scattered throughout the known region, and yet they belong to God. Okay, that, that's the massive mega theme of the entire letter. Basically, you could say it this way. The mega theme of 1 Peter, the theme that Peter is really thinking about the whole time is, hey, you've been chosen by God. You follow Jesus. You've been saved by him. You're, you're trying to live as an outcast of society and you're scattered and lonely. Like, whew, that, that's Peter's framework. So as chosen outsiders who are scattered and lonely, Peter wants his listeners to live in a manner that honors the God that they claim to follow. Here's the thing. In America, it's popular to say, I follow God. Oh, yeah? Prove it. That, that's always my end. Prove that you follow God. Like, let's see, let's see the fruit. There ain't no fruit. The tree's dead. Let's see if we can get the tree to come alive. Well, I can't make the tree to come alive. Only God can do that, right? <clears throat> so if you were to look at chapter 2 now, skip forward to chapter 2, look at verses 11 through 12. You would see that Peter says this. He says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners, this is journeyers, like aliens living in a place that's foreign to them because our true home is in heaven, not here. So hard for us to conceptualize because every time something goes insane politically, everything, every time something goes insane in my home, I start living in this weird, depressive type angry place. Like somehow I need to fix all of this, right? And then somehow my life's going to be better. And it's like, man, I, I got issues when I start thinking that my circumstances are going to make my life better. Because there's people who live in captivity who have closer relationships with the Lord than you and I do. So, beloved, I urge you as sojourners, 2, 11 through 12, and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Think about it. There, there's something that's actually at war against our soul. Passions of the flesh, the things that we want really, really bad. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, when they call you evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. In other words, the day that Jesus comes back, right? What Peter wants his listeners to do is he wants them to live godly lives 
so that those who are not Christians might actually be attracted to Jesus and might begin to follow him too. But the question is, what does that look like, right? Anybody asking that question? Okay, Peter says I should live my life in a way that honors God. What does that actually look like? Tell me. So what Peter says in verses 13 through 25 of chapter 2, moving our way through it, is he tells his listeners, if you look at it, and I, and I would challenge you, go check out the context I'm laying down for you. Take a note. Don't just take my word for it, because sometimes guys get this wrong, right? So make sure you test me out. The way that Peter tells his listeners to live their lives in a way that actually honors God, he says, hey, I want you to use your freedom, interesting choice of words, basically, I want you to use your freedom to submit to an evil government. That's hard to even think about. Submit, not go to war against. Hmm. And he also says, I want you to submit to unjust employers. What? That's countercultural. Like the culture doesn't teach us that. What does the culture teach us? Culture teaches us go to war against your government, and the culture teaches us talk trash about your boss and quit and get a, get a better job. Okay? That's what the culture teaches us. The Bible doesn't teach us that. The Bible actually teaches us here in 1 Peter, submit to that evil government and submit to the unjust employer. Why? Why is the question? If you look at verses 21 through 25 of chapter 2, you'll see the answer is this, because this is what it looks like to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. You think about Jesus. He was tortured. He was murdered by his enemies. He submitted to that treatment. And Peter basically says, this is why I'm telling you to live this way, because you claim to follow this Savior, and this is what your Savior actually did. Your Savior didn't go to war against the government. Your Savior didn't go to war against unjust employers. Your Savior died on a cross. He was beaten brutally. He was murdered by his enemies. Why? Why would Jesus do all that, and why would we be expected to follow in those footsteps? Why? So that God's enemies could have an opportunity to become family. Like, that's the message of the gospel. Anything less or different than that from this text is an anti-gospel, it's unbiblical, and it's false teaching. Okay? So, now that Peter has laid that foundation... That's what we're coming out of. Again, doing good work in the text before just taking the text and going, oh, it applies this way in some weird way that it's not supposed to, right? Now that he's laid that framework, he lays forth what it means to conduct our lives as citizens of a nation, not only as citizens of a nation, not only as employees with bosses, but now he moves into this most intimate of relationships, the relationship between a wife and a husband, a husband and a wife. And he lays forward what it looks like to be husbands and wives who actually conduct our lives in a manner that's worthy of the God we claim to follow. So, with all that foundation laid, right? I know some of you are like, man, that's 22 minutes. With all that foundation laid, now we can dive into the text. The text in front of us. Peter's basically answering this question, what does it mean to be a godly wife? Well, what does it mean to be a godly husband? His answer, we'll start with godly wife. His answer is basically this. A godly wife should practice submission. Please don't check out on me now because we're going to deal with that word. Okay, we're going to deal with that. I think we're going to deal with it rightly. <clears throat> a godly wife practices submission. She cultivates inner beauty, pays attention to godly role models. So number one, a godly wife practices submission. That's a tough word. Um, this is probably the reason I didn't want to preach this text. <laughs> Not only that, but I know many of your stories in this room, some of you women, of course, um, and, and many of you men. I know the stories, and, and many of you know, and I've walked some of this with you, um, deep, deep, dark, hard ditches. So, so when I think about this word, man, like this word doesn't get a lot of airplay in the culture we live in, right? Like when you think about this word submit, it sounds belittling, okay? There's far too many idiotic preachers who have preach this word, preach this text, preach the principle of submission very insensitively, <coughs> very unbiblically, call them false teachers. I make no bones about that. <coughs> uh, not only that, but my experience. So this is going to be harsh. So if you need help explain this to your kids, let me know afterwards. My experience with so-called Christian men Men who like to grab their Bibles and hold them up in one hand and quote this specific passage, 
thou must submit to me. Those so-called Christian men, man, they, they, they oftentimes leave me like shaking my head in absolute disgust, if not thinking thoughts of murder, just to be really honest. My, my wife and I have joked for years that we want to start a sub-ministry of our church ministry called the Back Road Baseball Bat Ministry. <laughs> for men who take this passage in one hand and beat their wives over the head with it while they got their hands down their pants consuming untold amounts of pornography throughout the week, or, on the other hand, hold this passage in their hand over that woman's head and then got the other hand around her throat. Those experiences would lead us to a place where we would say, man, that's not godly, that's not biblical, right? And here's the thing. There might be some of you in the room who are really uncomfortable with what I'm saying right now, but this is the reality of the world we live in. It may not be the reality of your world, but the question is, how do you minister in this world? That would be my question. How do you get after running a rescue mission within the yard of hell to this kind of family, this kind of man, or this kind of woman. This is stuff that we've wrestled with. Now, it shouldn't be this way. That's the nature of sin. It's the nature of the broken world we live in. It should not be this way. God did not design to us to be this way. Here's something I'm comforted by, and I, I would hope this would be a place of comfort. Again, before I even jump into the word submission, I hope that this will be a comfort to any of you in this room, ladies especially. I'm comforted by the fact that if these men that I'm thinking of in my mind, that I would be happy to preach to, and even almost name for you from the pulpit, because I see Paul doing the same thing when he names men who have acted in ways that are destructive to the kingdom of God, but I'll save that list for another time, right? What I would say to those men is if those men never arrive at repentance this side of heaven, then here's what's going to happen. They will arrive at the gates of hell with their teeth kicked in from a good old-fashioned curb stomping, according to Psalm 3. Number one, their knees are going to be broken by the iron scepter that my king holds in his hand, according to Psalm 2.9. And he, when he comes, he comes to avenge the abuse of the saints with his clothes drenched in blood. He's got a sword for a ton. He's got lightning bolts for eyes. He's got a tattoo on his right thigh that rightly proclaims himself as the king of kings and the lord of lords, which should humble any man who thinks he's the king or the lord of his home. So that to me is a comfort to know that justice will be served. Because our God is a God of justice. I hope that that would be a comfort to any godly woman in this place or hearing this message. Look forward to if you've endured the pain and suffering at the hands of some abusive little boy with a mustache who loves to call himself a man. Now, with all that said, despite all the abuse uh, of that word submission, Peter does still carry on with his instruction, right? On submission from the previous verses that I already listed in chapter 2, verses 13 to 25. And what does he do? He instructs godly wives to what? Look back at the text with me. Verses 1 through 2. He instructs godly wives to be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, <coughs> they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Okay? So here's the thing. A godly wife not called to submit to her husband's abuse. Godly wife is not called to ignore her husband's sinful addictions. A godly wife is not called to compromise her own faith. A godly wife is called to submit to her husband's leadership as far as reasonably possible. <coughs> she should not be constantly preaching at him. Okay, Not a problem sharing God's word. She should not be constantly preaching at him should seek to win her husband, especially an unbelieving husband, over to the Lord by her own personal walk of purity and respect. This is basically what Peter says. What Peter has in his mind is this image of a godly wife who practices submission in all things that are actually respectful and pure, while at the same time standing against anything that is filthy and sinful. And the outcome just might be that her husband might begin following Jesus too. The image of a woman who fiercely stands against anything in her husband 
that is sinful and destructive, that's the picture of Jesus because she's modeling Jesus in that because Jesus stands against anything sinful and destructive. <coughs> so when a woman does that, she's modeling her Savior. Make sense? Second thing Peter says to a godly wife is that a godly wife actually cultivates inner beauty. Okay? Now women in Peter's day and in our own day, I think are constantly confronted with images of what the world around us says is beautiful. Agreed? The world is constantly barraging our women and our ladies with these images. The image is an hourglass figure. It's larger breasts. It's a tinier waistline. It's curvy hips. It's long flowing hair. It's impeccably tanned skin. It's clothing that accentuates the figure. It's revealing little teasing portions of the skin. It's jewelry that says I am valuable because of the valuable jewelry I'm wearing. Okay? That's the external adornment that the world promotes for a woman who is actually worthy of attention. That's the message that is subjectively preached at us all day long by the culture we live in. And Peter, here's the thing. Unless you hear me wrong or hear Peter wrong, Peter's not against wearing clothing. Agreed? Okay, y'all are awake, right? You'd agree, right? I don't think Peter's against wearing clothing. I mean, unless we're all supposed to be a nudist colony, I don't think that's the case. Okay? I realize Adam and Eve were naked in the garden, but we ain't there anymore. Okay? We might be there in heaven, and then I'm just, you know, we're free of the sexual impulses, sinful sexual impulses that come along with that. So, I don't think Peter's against wearing clothes, or even nice clothes for that matter. I don't think he's against wearing makeup or jewelry. I don't think he's against making your hair look good, right? You're not just supposed to get out of bed and just come to church and be like, ah, screw it. Peter says I shouldn't pay attention to my hair. No, no. That would be a really bad misapplication of the text, okay? See, he's not necessarily concerned about the, listen, the attention that a woman gets from the way she dresses herself. Not even necessarily concerned about that, although <coughs> Christians love to make it all about that all the time, okay? Not, although, and, and you can make implications of it, but at the end of the day, it's not about the attention the woman gets from the way she dresses or the way she, she makes herself up. What I think Peter is actually concerned about is the attention that a woman pays to true beauty. Like currency. Ladies, the attention that you pay to true beauty is like currency. Your attention is like currency. The question is, where are you spending that currency? That's what he's saying at the core. That's why he says, <coughs> verses 3 and 4, look at that with me. <coughs> Do not let your adorning be external. The braiding of the hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which in God's sight is very precious. You know, for, for those ladies that are in this room that have, that have gone through um, horrendous things with, with, uh, with men in their lives in the past, I would say, and I can say this to my wife and love to say this to her all the time too, that one of the things that I see as fruit coming out of that, those horrendous seasons is that God has created within you a very gentle and quiet and firm and resolute spirit, and it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. Like, that's the sexiest thing you can see. Okay? And my problem is, I love women. Oh, gosh. Don't take that sound bite out of <laughs> context. Rick. No, no, but seriously, like, <laughs> but seriously, at the same time, like, with tears in my eyes, I would say I, I love women because God has created you to be an image of, of who he is. And God, it pisses me off when, when a man abuses a woman. So there's, and I also know my own broken past, and I know the abuse that I dished out. So there's, there's not only this, this sense of like, God, I want to protect women in the own sense of being humiliated and humbled by my own sin that Jesus saved me from. So uh, please just feel that tension. Okay. A godly wife should pay just as much attention, if not more, to, to what God actually calls precious, and that's the cultivation of true beauty in a gentle and quiet spirit, okay? Finally, third thing Peter says, <coughs> 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 
It says that a godly uh, wife uh, needs to have godly role models. This is kind of like a no-duh moment. Um, like we all know that we become just like the people that we surround ourselves with. And I think that we also uh, like to look for someone that we admire or, or we look to someone that we actually envy. And we try to be just like them, right? Um, I mean, you've got to come out of this other side on submission and inner beauty as a woman. And you've got to start going, well, how do I even pursue that? Like, how do I know if it's right to actually submit to my husband right now? Or how do I know, like, if I'm actually pursuing inner beauty right now? And, 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 and what Peter, you know, in, in, in his own, like, Holy Spirit-inspired way just goes, hey, here's how you can get after that. Get yourself a good godly role model. That's what he basically says. So we all look to somebody. But oftentimes, we don't, we don't tend to do the work of seeking out godly role models. And especially what I, if I've seen a trend in, in ladies, I, like I've, hear, I've heard women say so many times, I really don't like other women. Any, other, any woman want to just admit, or, no, no, but no, don't throw yourself under the bus, <laughs> if you will. Um, I, I've heard more women say that than not. Like I'd rather just hang out with a couple of dudes because whatever, for whatever reason. I'm not even going to go there. Um, ladies, you've got to find a good godly role model. And Peter knows that, and so this is what he says. He lays out Sarah as the godly role model, okay? He says, this is how the holy women who hoped in God, verses 5 and 6, used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Oh, that's a tough one. I just I have a hard time with the phrase, period. And you are her children, uh, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Now, I, I don't have time to spend a ton of time on this, but I just got to say, at first glance, Makes sense that Peter would call it the image of Sarah for his listeners, okay? So, I, I, ladies, if you could, uh, like, think right now about a woman who's been famous over the last 10 to 20 years that you would look up to and say, man, that lady, she, she's a good, godly woman, and, and I look up to her, right? I don't know who that would be for you, but for the Israelites, Sarah was that woman, okay? Sarah was on the front page of all the magazines, okay? So Sarah was in all the news feeds, um, she was basically the matri one of the matriarchs of the entire nation, okay? She was one of the women that all the women looked up to. Uh, she, she, she was a woman who was very much the hero of the Israelite nation, especially the Israelite women. But here's the thing. Here's the thing that twists me up, okay? Uh, if you do the work on the text and, and you look at what Peter says and you go back and you study the life of Sarah and you especially look at this part that Peter points to. It's in Genesis 18. You got to go read the story. It blows my mind. Like I, Christy could tell you, we're standing on the porch and I'm like, I, Peter got it wrong. I know it's Holy Spirit inspired, but freaking Peter got it wrong. Okay. I, if you go back and you read the story. It makes absolutely no sense at first glance, which is why good, solid, deep Bible study asking good questions is really important because for a while there, I was like questioning the Lord, like, Lord, what the heck were you thinking? And he was like, who are you to question me? No, he wasn't like that at all. He was like, let me show you. <clears throat> what you find in Genesis 18 is Sarah. She's laughing in disbelief at her husband. Anybody, any, any ladies want to laugh in disbelief at your husbands? And it's not a sin. Like, it's not sinful to do so at this time. Um, my wife laughs at me in disbelief whenever I say, hey, I want to go plant churches out of the back of a uh, rolling mobile home. Uh, she's been laughing at me for nine years. Now, at this point, I'm like, I'll never plant another church again. This is the hardest dang thing I've ever done in my entire life. Just nearly killed me a few times. Anyway, it's not about me. Um, she's laughing. She's laughing in disbelief at her husband. And ultimately, in Genesis 18, she's actually laughing at the Lord, okay? Because she just hears her husband's conversation with God. <coughs> and God's like, hey, yo, I'm going to give you a son. You know, they're like 150 years old. That's not, they're not that old, but they're ancient, okay? Lots of cobwebs going on with Abraham and Sarah. And they're, and they're, and they're barren. They've got no kids, okay? Um, and I think, that, I think that Sarah even says something on the lines of, like, you, you expect us two old people to have pleasure at this, at this age? Like, it's pretty explicit, okay? Um, and you're going to produce a baby from that? She's ultimately laughing at God in the, in the midst of that promise, now, you know, if you know the story of Sarah at all, um, I think, you know, out, out of Sarah and Abraham comes who? Isaac. 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 Even in this moment of weakness, though, for Sarah, 
Um, Sarah proves herself to be a godly wife who submits to her husband. Uh, it's crazy. Ultimately submits to the Lord after the Lord confronts her for her disbelief. So the moral of this entire story, coming all the way back to Peter, is that Peter, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, shows us, shows women, um, especially in this moment, um, that even in Sarah's moment of sinful weakness, uh, she not only submits to Abraham, but, but ultimately she submits to Abraham because of her trust in the Lord. And that's the kind of role model that Peter has in mind for the wives he's addressing. So get this. The kind of role model that Peter has in mind for, for the women he's addressing, <coughs> if they're going to continue to become godly wives, uh, whose conduct actually honors the Lord, as they learn how to practice submission and learn how to cultivate inner beauty, um, they're, they're going to need a role model worth uh, emulating. And here's what they don't need. And I think here's the problem. When you and I, men or women, start looking for a, a godly role model, we start looking for somebody who's perfect. Right? And there's only one who's perfect. Sarah is not the woman who is perfect, but Sarah points to the person who is perfect, and that's God. So what you need to look for in, 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 a, in a godly role model is somebody who's imperfect, but continuously trusts the Lord despite what lies in front of them. Okay? So let's bounce out of the, uh, the wife's side of this, take a few moments on the men, the reality is most of the text was aimed at the women, okay? And uh, uh, there's only very little aimed at the man. I'm still going to pull three points out, but I'm going to be fairly brief. That's one verse, and I'm out of time anyways. Uh, well, I mean, we're not at an hour yet, so I'm out of time. What is the conduct of a godly husband, okay? Somebody, somebody, would somebody just ask that question real fast? What's the conduct of a godly husband? Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy. I just needed to get a drink, that's all. <laughs> so I already laid it on the line earlier, right? Pretty explicitly, I'm going to do it one more time, very briefly. When I spoke about little boys with mustaches who love to call themselves men, while they hold their little Bibles over their wife's head, they got one hand down their pants, they're looking at pornography, or they got their other hand around their wife's neck. Um, I've already painted that negative image that I think... For the most part, every man in this room probably needs to find some point of repentance from, at some level. Um, the opposite of that picture is a man who never engages. He's the passive man who hides out in all of his hobbies or his job, right? Um, but never engages with his wife. Um, so you've got the aggressive and you've got the passive. I'm a really aggressive dude, I'm sure you can tell. So it's easier for me to like cast the image of the very aggressive man. Um, at the end of the day, I think every one of us of men, as men and women, we have places where we need to repent from the places that we failed in this, right? And here's what repentance means. It means making a U-turn on the road of life. Problem is a lot of us are like turning 360s, right? We're, we're doing cookies. We're not doing U-turns. <laughs> we're stuck doing cookies and trying to figure out how do I change? I get that. I hope that somewhere in this you're going to get some, some encouragement and some hope that God can, still does, and will radically change your life if you submit to him. The U-turn on the road of life is what repentance looks like. And what it means is it means to come to grips with your sin, honestly, in light of the suffering of Jesus at the cross on your behalf, and then turning with your newfound freedom and obedience to the commands of Scripture as the Holy Spirit that enables you to. So what Peter says about godly husbands is this. Here's three basic brief things. It says that we must work to understand our wives, must show honor to our wives, must pray with our wives. Number one, godly husband works to understand his wife. Look at it in verse 7. When Peter says, likewise husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, what's he implying? Simply implying that a husband is called to do life with his wife. Rhymes, no I'm not a poet, no I'm not a rapper, but it could make itself into a song somewhere, okay? A godly husband is called to do life with his wife. Marriage is not about cohabitation with benefits in the bedroom. Marriage is about doing life together, okay? Life is hard work. Think about this. And whoever said that a woman is hard to understand was onto something, okay? Now, ladies, y'all can get mad at me for a moment. It's fine. 
I'm actually setting this up to be a good thing, okay? <laughs> what, wh whoever, whoever thought this up, whoever thought this up to say, I mean, th and guys, guys' brains, like waffles, boxes, right? Like, you get in into the, the right box with me, and then we get out of that box, we close that box, we get into another box, we talk about that. Well, women, women don't do boxes, don't do waffles. Um, women, women got spirals of computer hardwiring that, like, misfires and, not misfires, but just fires. Really crazy. Like here, 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 and here. And, and pretty soon the man's like, dude, I got whiplash. Okay, just get me in a box. I mean, God in his own, this is why I say, like whoever said that women are hard to understand was actually really on to something. Because here's the deal. I think that if a woman was easy to understand, then no man would ever be able to rise to the challenge of what Peter's actually saying here. It should be a challenge, men. There's no reason that we should think that figuring out our wives should be easy. It's also not an excuse to tap out on it either, okay? Like the call for a husband to work hard to understand his wife, that can only actually be pursued in a God-honoring way <coughs> if we as men have surrendered to the pursuit of Jesus on our lives. Like none of us as men are going to continue in any kind of sustained pursuit of actually understanding our wives' emotions, our wives' needs, our wives' dreams, our wives' desires, unless you and I have encountered a Savior who has laid down his life in pursuit of our own rotten, sin-filled souls. Okay? So until you meet Jesus, this is a pursuit that's impossible, in my estimation. You can sure try. It's impossible without. So men, I would say this. In this first point... One of the best battlefields you can wage war on. Listen, if you're not married, but you want to get married someday, practice this now. Because you don't have to be married to practice this as a man. One of the best battlefields you can wage war on is the battlefield of understanding a wife's heart or a woman's heart as you spend intentional time listening to her, asking good questions without trying to fix her. The problem is that most men don't want to fight this battle. A lot of men want to go watch pornography because that's easy. So I would say if you're single even, and that's your struggle, turn off the computer, go get a relationship with a real woman, and actually do some good hard time of understanding that woman without trying to get anything out of her. Just try to serve her. Follow me? I think that's why Peter says that a godly husband works to understand his wife. Second, godly husband shows honor to his wife. The culture around us, I think, is ripe with a value that actually belittles and sexualizes women for the personal pleasures of a man. And somehow or another, the world around us has actually twisted like this, this version of femininity and masculinity and some ugly image of this beer-guzzling, muscular dude with a beard and a flannel. Uh, Chill out, sweetie. <laughs> Goodness. I t you had no idea where I was headed with this, but uh, this does not fit. She's my wife. But the problem with this image that you see in the culture is that it's that kind of a man that gets the attention of the hot, barely dressed model crossing the street. Okay? Um, that image has a lot more to do with sexual impulses than a lifelong commitment of loving, sacrifice, and honor. Um, showing honor. Showing honor is what Peter expects of a godly husband. Show honor to your wife. Show honor to the women around you. This is why he says, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. That's a tough one. I'll get to it. Since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. Now, now when Peter says that the woman is the weaker vessel, gosh, he does not mean that a woman is in any way inferior to a man. It drives me nuts when people take this and twist it and make it say something that it doesn't. Uh, th this is actually proven in what he follows up that follows that up with when he says that a woman is a mutual partaker of God's invaluable grace. Okay, Peter does not say, "Hey, hey, men, you get like twenty percent of God's grace, but you women, like those women, they need seventy-five percent of God's grace." He doesn't say that. He says that as men and women, we both are partakers of God's invaluable grace. So really, it's almost as though Peter is saying here, he's saying, hey, guys, honor your wife. Honor the women around you as mutual recipients of God's saving grace, even though she might be physically, physically smaller than you. That's all he's saying. Make sense? 
Now, there are some women that are physically larger than me and could kick my butt. There are some WWE wrestler chicks out there that I would not want to cross. Okay? Um, I still want to honor any woman um, God has placed in my path. At the end of the day, a godly husband is going to show honor to his wife. Why? Why would a man even do this? Well, because he understands that she needs Jesus just as much as he does. He needs Jesus just as much as she does. And the same thing that was spent to save him was also spent to save her, right? Mutual equality together. Number three, last point. Godly husband prays with his wife. <coughs> a godly husband prays with his wife. Look at the text again. When Peter says in verse 7, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. What's the final thing he says? So that, it's, this is a condition, it's a conditional statement. Say, hey, if you do this, then this may happen. So that your prayers may not be hindered. What's he implying? He's implying that husbands are expected to pray with and for their wives. And he's also saying, hey, if you do this, if you follow these instructions, your prayers may not be hindered. Now, it's not a blanket promise, okay? Not a blanket promise. We all know that God does not answer every prayer that we pray in the way that we would like him to on this side of heaven. But the implication still remains here that husbands should pray with their wives and I think the only thing that's going to motivate a man to do this once again is the image of Jesus who intercedes in prayer for us in the presence of the Father despite our constant rebellion against him. So men pray with your wife as you work to understand her and as you work to show her honor because this is the honor that she deserves as a mutual recipient of God's grace. Amen? See when you Men, when you, last thing before conclusion, when you, when you see your wives as somebody who is a mutual recipient of God's grace, then you no longer see a woman as somebody that you use for your own personal gratification. When you understand the grace that's been poured out on you, it's also been poured out on the women around you and your wife, that moves your heart and it's transforming. Grace is the only thing that will transform you. All of the legalistic law I've preached, do this, do this, do this, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. That will not change you. It will not. The only thing that will change you is when you recognize how often you've broken all the do's and the don'ts of Scripture and how much grace has been poured out upon you. When you recognize that picture, going back to the reason why, why did Peter say, submit to an unjust employer? Why did Peter say, submit to an evil government? Why did Peter tell wives to submit to their husbands? Why? Because of that picture of Jesus in verses 13 through 25, roughly, of chapter 2. It's the picture of a Savior who submitted himself to others around him so that he might be abused, so that he might save us, so that his grace could be lavished upon us. Amen? So I pray that you would meet Jesus in these final moments together. If you would, please stand with me. Father, as we close our time together, Lord, I pray that you would come and do a ministering work among us, that your spirit would come and give conviction where sin is present and give hope where freedom is offered, that you would help us to continue to grow into the men and women that you call us to be. Help us to rest our lives, our failures especially, at the foot of a bloody cross, in the doorway of an empty tomb. Help us to hold on to the promise of the hope of heaven where all things will be set right once and for all. Lord, we trust you in Jesus' name.